David Frangioni, the Modern Drummer Podcast, live from Hollywood, Florida, backstage in the dressing room of this week's esteemed guest, the one and only Danny Carey. Thanks for having me. Man, thank you for joining us, man. Thank you. This is great. (laughs) You're on the Fear Inoculum Tour, of course, COVID interrupted, but still rolling. A long tour, time-wise, but uh, not so much for show-wise. You know, yeah, we're getting there. That's going well. Amazing record. I know everyone out there's checked it out. It's incredible. Um, and on your rundown, you talk about um, you know some of the tracks on there and the drum centric track that you did about our favorite cookie. Oh yeah, yeah, chocolate chip trip. Yeah. And so so <laughs> check out that. the rundown for that, everybody. So let's talk drumming for a second from a, an educational perspective. Who were your teachers and and who made who taught you the most, made the greatest impact, and and kind of gave you the the facility that you then evolved into your own style from? Who are some of those guys? Well, growing up in a little town in Kansas, uh, I'm kind of subject to the best drummer in the town. His name was Brian Ayers, and uh, he was a really great drummer, actually, for such a little town. He ended up playing in the Navy band and all the stuff. And, uh, got me started in the right direction, reading and all that, which was cool. And then I played in the big band in high school. He prepared me for that. And, um, and then, uh, a guy named Alan Carter, um, he was the Dean of the music school up at the university of Minnesota for a while, but he also taught Travis Barker actually out in California. (laughs) He's the one that took me through, uh, advanced techniques for the modern drummer, the Jim Chapin book. And, uh, Taught me how to sing the notes, and as I was reading them, you know, and and swing and do it all the proper way too. And it really brought my playing to life. It gave me a lot more personality, I think, in my strokes and things. And he studied with Joe Morello, which was a really cool thing to have that kind of knowledge coming at me as a seventeen-year-old kid. So and I got a lot out of it. And, the you know, technique that Joe, yeah, you know, yeah, taught it making the like, stick work for you, right? And, and Al well, yeah. taught you those things. Yeah, he gave yeah, you those exercises was, to practice. A, I owe a lot to Al and that. So thanks, Al. <laughs> Amazing. And and then on your drum journey after studying with Alan, um, what was like the next big? lesson or or evolution in your playing what really kind of how did you keep taking it next level um well he alan kind of prepped me to go to the conservatory of music in kansas city so i went there for four years at umkc and uh did like jazz playing up there a lot and just being in kansas city playing live gigs and stuff with some of the heavier players up there i got a lot out of that i, I was fortunate enough to play with a trumpet player named stan kessler some and Joe Cartwright, those guys are still playing in Kansas City, just kicking ass, you know. They have all the cool gigs, you know. <laughs> and you have to great. play with them. Yeah, yeah, that that was an eye-opener, you know, just to play with any players, you know, that are on that level, you know. It's, uh, you know, pushes you as hard as you can, you know, increases your vocabulary and, and in all directions, so. For sure. And yeah. and then what was the, did you go to L.A. from there, or what was, how did you kind of yeah, break out of Kansas? Yeah, after years at UMKC, I I left there and I actually I went to Portland for about a year and up there there was a it was a big funk scene at that time the Jeff Lorber Fusion was playing up there oh, and Kenny wow, G okay. and all these guys a band called Cooler was real big and uh, oh man I'm trying to think uh, Pleasure like a, they had a big hit called Glide and all these it was so it was, uh, it was, it was a kind scene. of fun you know yeah, it was a scene up there now it's it's a real heavy doom and gloom kind of scene like heavy rock going on in Portland you know more after the grungy thing it kind of oh, everything shifted a bit but uh but uh, it was you know it wasn't really working out that well for me so from there 1983 I guess it was I moved down to L A and uh, well, went left Portland at that time. I I couldn't afford it the first time. I had to go back to Kansas and play for top forty gigs and okay. whatnot. And saved up some money. I moved, actually moved to L.A. in '86, and then I've been there ever since. You know. Wow. Okay. And in L.A., that's like a whole other thing when you discover that scene. Yeah, because it was huge hair metal scene was at that time. I wasn't really into that world. And luckily, right. uh, Nirvana came along pretty quickly and put all that to waste. So <laughs> it was all good timing for. The timing of us putting tool together um and it all worked out but uh, we played in all the clubs in hollywood back then there was 20 different places at least you could play in playing rock music you know they the djs kind of put into a lot of that which is kind of sad but uh 
but uh, yeah, we we came along at the right time, and uh, that was an education in itself too. You know? And you always practice. You always believed in practicing a lot to perfect your art. Yeah. So you seem like a student, an eternal student. To your credit. Yeah, that was one of the like all the greats. I'll yeah. have, the, all the greats I've met are eternal students. Yeah, you end up sacrificing. Uh, creature comforts to be able to make noise when you're living. <laughs> like I, I didn't really have an apartment, really. I would look for a, somebody's garage or a warehouse or something that I could just move into and rough it just so I could set my kid up and be playing. And that's how I ended up getting putting the tool band together with Adam and Maynard and you know Paul DeMore at that time was because I had the space. We could rehearse, you know, so I'd... All the other drummers, I think they were trying out a couple other guys maybe, and they they would flake out because drummers never want to move their stuff, you know. <laughs> Mine was all set up, ready to go, and I had a little PA system, so it made things simple. And know? do you also play on a pad? Do you go between kit and pad? For, uh, sometimes. For... My, my warm-up ritual is real. Uh, I do it on a pad just here in the dressing room, and uh, I try to go through a bunch of rudimental things, you know, whatever it takes, and then just – do different stick exercises. I usually put on some kind of music or whatever, so it's use that as a metronome where I have okay. a little freedom and just kind of jam along to it, but uh, just to cut the blood flowing. You know? Then I always uh, I jump rope for a couple of minutes, always oh, okay. to warm all my arms and everything up before I go on stage. That's the last thing I do before I hit the stage is to do jump rope. Yeah. And how long is your uh, practice routine typically before you get to the jump rope? On, um, on the pad about pad? a half hour usually. Oh, okay. I did no less than a half hour. I try if I don't do a half hour, I don't feel good about it. But I think it saved me in the long run. I've never had any problems with my hands or right. you know, considering how or anything, hard you knock have on to wood. play. <laughs> well, you have to play so hard to you know because it's a loud yeah loud it's a band. loud band and uh so it's very physical i go through three snare drum heads every night like they crater them out or whatever so yeah usually uh, about halfway through our first set i call it you know i swap out my snare drum and then the we take a little bit of a break and i usually come out and do a solo or something and then so that's a fresh snare head on that one too and it just it sounds way better too having fresh heads you know Thanks to Evans, you know, for taking care of me. <laughs> yep, Evans heads. Evans heads. <laughs> and so your influences, we've talked about this off camera. We have some of the same influences. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, Carl Palmer, Bill Bruford, Billy Cobham. Yeah, Those yeah. are big influences for you. Let's talk about. Yeah. All the prog guys, you know, Phil Collins and, uh, you know, God, yeah. Any of the, any of the prog drummers of it. That was what I grew up on. The, the, the drumming was always interesting. Once I was playing the drums, that was all my musical focus went into that world. And then, uh, and then getting turned on to fusion, like I said, with Billy and Maha Vishnu and uh, Lenny White and Tony Williams and all that stuff just hit home really hard. And that, that helped get me into the jazz world more, uh, for sure. And that's when Alan Carter was helping me out, too. So it all fed off of each other. And off you go, you know. Yeah. It's a whole huge world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot and, to explore. And there. it's endless. Yeah, yeah. That's the beauty of it. And, you know, you're an innovator on hybrid kit you know electronics and acoustic drums and, and all kinds of different sounds uh cymbals etc where where what what inspired you to kind of get into that because you've taken it very very far so how did that how did that passion get triggered um 
I, th- I guess a lot of it was probably from Bill Bruford's plane, you know, um, when that, uh, the discipline record came out that was like a mind blower you know i think that kind of blew every drummer's mind in a way because yeah. uh the approach was different it was so much more textural than uh, a lot of other drumming and that and the whole shift in music kind of in the 80s you know man that simmons sound and everything it just sounded really cool at yeah. the time you know it, yeah it could wear thin now or it sounds a bit dated a lot of it but uh but I never really innovative. tried to use the the electronic drums as a replacement for my kit because I I love the sound of my real drums so I I like the idea of using them as more textures and colors to throw into songs and things or I got a Simmons SDX fairly early on I guess well it wasn't like when they came out because they were ungodly expensive oh, I know? remember <laughs> I, I was like car so, SDX car so, SDX yeah after the after the grunge movement kind of hit. It was so uncool to have electronic drums. I was like, "This is great!" So I, I just snaked in and got mine for like a thousand bucks or twelve hundred dollars, I think. Wow. And uh, and then I could sample, and that opened the doors completely for me to be able to have congas and djembes or just any kind of ethnic instruments I wanted at my fingertips and not have to carry all this crap around, you know. So mm-hmm. that was a, a big plus for me, and I I used that for years until they. I just kind of wore them out. They're not very roadworthy instruments. <laughs> no, no, that's for sure. Yeah, so that's when I hit up Vince actually to make a replacement for it. So the pads I have were kind of a initial experiment. Because you know, the SDX pads had those zones, had like nine zones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah cause, so we were kind of emulating that and maybe trying to take it a step further. And that's how that came about. It was a matter of necessity, though, if I wanted to keep using the sim- electronic stuff on the road or the Simmons sounds and things. So it all worked out, you know. I, I got really lucky to find Vince. Yeah. And you you love that side of it, though. It seems like besides what it does musically, like you're into the actual like creation oh, yeah, it's side, fun, yeah. right? Because there's, there's a lot to learn that's not plug and play, right? Yeah, I mean, you yeah, actually have to get into it. I always like tinkering with things, I guess, and I... I've been collecting modular synthesizers for quite a while and okay. I have lots of good toys. Be careful though, hours will just evaporate. <laughs> mm-hmm. And if you ever get a good sound, you better record it because yeah. you probably won't get it back. <laughs> yeah, at least especially. unless you're an extreme expert at it, that's for sure. I'm I'm not that good when I get something that's really hard for me to go back a year later and get the same sound again. It's it's such a sensitive thing, but it's, it's a lot of fun and I, I enjoy it. Yeah. And when did you discover that? Um, I think that kind of came f- with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer and stuff, you know, back in the prog rock days. I always loved stuck synthesizer with sounds and stuff, yeah, and uh, yeah, big Moogs and all that. I was just fascinated with the, the science of it as much as the musicality of it. Right, I guess, right. You know? <laughs> and that, and, and it's, you stayed inspired, and then as musical you know, opportunities or, or situations came about, you implemented and integrated that yeah, in yeah, a really you, musical that's way. part of developing your own sound. What You know, you have to inject your personality in whatever way you can, you know, be it your physicality or your, your interest, whatever it takes, you know. Mm-hmm. That's where we all get our styles from, I guess. You know? Right, yeah. right. And those influences <laughs> evolved. You took, you were inspired and influenced, um, and then from there said, okay, I'm going to, integrated in my this is how i this is how i hear it and, and yeah how it applies yeah. to the music that i'm playing yeah and it's you know we all when we're writing songs we do it kind of as a group effort so we're pushing and pulling in each way and so that's another way i can kind of inject my input into the tunes and direct them where i hope they will go though it never really quite works it's always sacrifices <laughs> and things along the way but that's what makes a band i guess uh, and what makes it, the process <laughs> exciting right yeah, the true. journey as they say is just as great or greater than the yeah. destination right most so of the time there. they turn out better than you would think you know than in the beginning <laughs> yeah. and you have the electronics <laughs> right at that stage while you're writing you'll say oh let me i hear a tabla thing yeah or, that's well while we're actually constructing the songs that's once the grooves start and all that they start taking on a character then i go well yeah this needs some bongos or you know what have you some right. ethnic instruments or something to give it a flavor and slant it this way that's uh that's how i use the electronic stuff for sure you know on top of the the groove that's set down just with hat kick and snare or whatever you know? right right and it's a heavy 
it's a heavy groove considering how how the drumming with the time signatures that you play and you know it's really there's a lot to unpack and and you know as a drummer when i try to learn anything that i'm listening to that you've played on these albums let's just take the latest one right yeah. uh yeah. it's cool. it's there's a it's it's complicated but it, it's and it's also heavy like it's usually you, i don't hear heavy drumming that has that level of nuance and intricacy and well, then and all the electronic <laughs> no for sure that's and obviously that's that's a big part of your style and that's what makes it awesome but what you know like what what's the 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 formula if you will or how did that kind of come well, about well it's kind of a you know necessity is the mother of invention adam and justin are just really heavy players so i have to be whipping ass pretty much just to keep on board and keep things pumping the way it is so that that's the regular kit definitely you know, the, like i said the hack kick and snare or have to have the solid beats you know laying down the, and, and on, the a, on seven or you know nine or 15 or whatever the time signature is i think you know you have to feel the pulse and just make sure that translate to people are grooving and dancing to these weird time <laughs> signatures right, right. which is i feel fortunate happens actually but then the rest is kind of the color and embellishment that I try to get across to to make it beautiful, make it make, make the color happen, and take the song and give it give it character. You know, that's the goal. You know, so, yeah. Well, it's it's uh, the sound is that that sound is is incredible, and it's and, and the eight inch snare, I guess, is a big part of besides how you hit it, but that that really deep cutting. It cuts, yeah, if you right? hit it's not hard, funny. it it's, really cuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and if you crank them up tight, you get the body big enough to take up the space to keep it all balanced, and uh, still have articulation. You know, that's I think a lot of people don't realize how sensitive and articulate a, a big snare drum can be. You know, but uh, that's the worst part is probably the weight. You know, I think my drummer has to wear like a Home Depot belt. <laughs> yeah, not I'll as bad it. as when I use the the old state or the old kit that Peisty made for me. Oh, <laughs> that's right. I, I, I ended up with half of those, a Carl's. <laughs> yeah, man. And you, you still have yours? Oh yeah. Yeah. I would never sell it. Well, <laughs> you're a lot of people might not realize you're a very serious collector of I've got musical instruments things, and, yeah, and yeah. electronics. And yeah, we've, we run into each other on the that's auctions. Right. Yeah. That's right. And we've now made a pact. that's on record now that we're going to align <laughs> From here on out, yeah. because we were up against the Carl Palmer kit. Oh, we were God. up against some Bruford stuff. We wasted thousands of dollars. We did Zappa's <laughs> latest thing. We we didn't align on that, and you know, look what happened. But yeah. but yeah, we we uh, we definitely stay uh, yeah, connected. I've been but. trying to buy lots of things from the joints, like guitars and synthesizers. I've like I said, I'm still in love with collecting those and drums There's, too. When the, when the right ones come along, Dennis uh, Chambers just sent me some links to some cool old like black beauties and stuff. Oh. So I don't have a real old black beauty, you know, oh, like wow. one from the thirties or forties. Oh or my goodness. So wow. I'm, I'm looking that way a little bit now. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, um, you wrote a book about your, you had your synthesizer collection. Oh yeah. Right? You had yeah, a book. Yeah. There. Remember the future. <laughs> so that's pretty awesome for anybody to check that out. Well, Look, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I know your schedule. We're going to we're going to wrap now. Uh, I want to inspire everybody to check out uh, the rundown that we have. That's a separate video, yeah. but the kit is just fantastic to take a deep awesome. dive on. So, Danny Carey, thank you Thanks. so much. Thanks so much, David. And I wish we had more time. We'll we'll do it again. For sure we will. <laughs> and Modern Drummer, thank you for watching and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks guys. Appreciate it.